All right, we'll go ahead and get started. I see folks coming in, uh, but I'll just go ahead and get started, started with intros. So hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Lee. I'm the Policy Director at Asian Americans Advancing Justice Atlanta, and I'm really excited to welcome you to our webinar on driver's licenses for all. Um, I'm here representing and as a member of the Freedom to Drive Coalition, which is a coalition of many different organizations that are advocating for this legislation. Uh, we have a great lineup of speakers for you today, and I will uh, introduce them briefly. Uh, we have Aisha Yakub Mamu and Annie Galani from the Asian American Advocacy Fund. Um, we have myself and Tom Fan from the from Asian Americans Advancing Justice Atlanta. We have Michelle Save from the Alma Bowman Sorrells campaign. And then we have Trent Leon from uh, Casa Maryland, uh, who will be speaking about his experience advoca advocating for driver's licenses for all in the state of Maryland as well. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of a roadmap of what we're gonna do today. Um, first, I'll turn it over to um, Aisha, Annie, and Michelle to talk a little bit about the impact of driver's licenses or the lack of driver's licenses has on people's lives. Um, if you have a driver's license and it was easy for you to get one, it's not probably something you think about every day, um, but just think about you know, how many times in a week you drive or when was the last time you were asked for your driver's license. Uh, I was in <laughs> Midtown a couple nights ago, and in order to rent one of those like electric bikes that are in town, I actually had to take a picture of my driver's license, which I didn't realize I had to before renting the bike. And so, you know, having a driver's license or not having one is something that impacts people every day. Um, and they're also going to talk about who it impacts. And um, then Tom is going to talk a little bit about um, sort of the legislative history of this issue and the solutions that we're advocating for around driver's licenses for all. And Trent is going to share some of his experience advocating for driver's licenses in the state of Maryland and a successful campaign there for driver's licenses in Georgia. Um, so we will, um, is the um, presentation up right now? Can we? Yes. Do you not see it? Oh, I don't. Okay, sorry. So just to uh, share a little bit about the coalition's vision and mission, um, if we can go just back one slide. We believe that everyone should have the freedom to drive in order to fully live their lives in the state of Georgia. And what we are advocating for is legislation that would expand that list of allowable forms of the documentation that would give better access to to many different populations who currently don't have access to driver's licenses in Georgia. So now I'm going to turn it over to Aisha uh, to talk a little bit more about the impact and who it impacts in the state. Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks for introducing us and for getting our webinar started. Um, my name is Aisha. I am the executive director of the Asian American Advocacy Fund, and we are a local grassroots organization um, in Georgia. And uh, before we talk a little bit about um, the issues that we face in Georgia for those that do not have driver's licenses, um, I thought it might be useful for us to share a little bit of um, a, a story about someone who was impacted by um, not being able to access a driver's license. Um, so today we have with us Michelle from the Justice for Alma Bowman campaign to share a story of someone who has been directly impacted. And um, Alma, uh, for those of you who don't know, Alma Bowman is a 56-year-old Filipina woman who was arrested by Fulton County Police during a traffic stop in 2017. Despite having permanent residency status, she was detained by Immigration and Customs of Enforcement for almost three years. During her incarceration, she experienced medical negligence at Irwin County Detention Center, um, which, as many of you know, gained international attention. This is the same facility that received national attention for performing unnecessary gynecological procedures on women. During her detention, Alma lost possession of her vehicle and ICE lost all of her legal documents, including her social security card. And she has currently an active deportation order, despite the fact that she held legal residency status prior to being detained by ICE. Without status, Alma cannot acquire a driver's license, work without paying extra fees or apply for health insurance. 
Alma is committed to staying in the United States with her son and raising awareness about her experiences to help others. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce it to Michelle so she can tell us, so they can tell us a little bit more about the campaign. Yes, thank you, Aisha, um, and thank you everyone for inviting us here today. Um, my name is Michelle Sauve. I'm the chapter coordinator for Malaya, Georgia. Um, we're a chapter of Malaya Movement USA, a grassroots organization that fights for um, democracy, sovereignty, and human rights for Filipinos um, in the Philippines and abroad. Um, and together with Gabriela and Migrante USA, um, we launched a national campaign as Aisha um, beautifully summarized um, the Justice for Alma Bowman campaign. And we're currently um, fighting to stop um, the deportation of Alma Bowman. Um, you know, since there was already context given about the case, um, I can go straight into, yeah, just the impacts of not having a driver's license, because I think it is something that, you know, for for folks who um, it's easy to access, we don't we don't think about. Um, but yes, prior to Alma's detainment, um, she did have a green card. So she had a driver's license before, um, but when she was released, ICE revoked the green card. So she currently doesn't have legal status. Um, and, you know, her not being able to apply for a driver's license has been one of the major stressors in her life. I mean, you know, you can't go out to get groceries, um, can't go to healthcare appointments. Um, she has to, luckily she has family, right? She has two sons that she can rely on that have a car, um, but it's, it's hard, right? When you're working all the time um, to be able to like make time to do an extra thing that you know, people like shouldn't have to rely on um, others, right, to just access their basic needs. Um, I think something too to point out with Alma is that she's based in Macon, Georgia. Um, so, you know, it there isn't like a comprehensive public transportation system. And one of the conditions of Alma's release is that she um, was required to attend quarterly check-ins with ICE. Um, and the ICE office is located in Atlanta. That's two hours north of Macon. And so without like a driver's license, she um, she's reliant on her sons to take her to these appointments, right? That she has to go to in order to be in compliance. But by law in the state of Georgia, she's restricted on her ways to get there. She's restricted because we don't have comprehensive public transportation. Um, she's restricted because, yeah, she can't get a driver's license. And so um, her sons have to take off of work. Um, in order to take her for her check-ins, which is, you know, another day that you miss pay. And so it doesn't even, not having a driver's license doesn't just impact like one person, but it impacts the whole family too. Um, and so, you know, that's not her fault. That's not the fault of an individual. That's a policy choice. Um, and it's one that Georgia can and should change. Um, the right to a driver's license, you know, gives us the basic freedom to live our lives. Um, and it's especially important um, when we consider like those who live outside of the metro Atlanta area um, where resources and other things are spread out. Um, you, it, you definitely need a car. Um, and so if you want to learn more about um, our campaign, the QR code on this slide goes to our link tree, um, which has our GoFundMe campaign interest form contact information, um, and just general information about the campaign. Um, we are currently looking um, for legal counsel to help fight Alma's deportation. So if you have any leads or contacts, please feel free to look at our link tree, send us an email or message. Um, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you so much for, for sharing that story. And we will be sure to send out the link um, in all the emails that we send out after the webinar as well so that folks can stay involved in the campaign. Um, next slide, please. So um, as you know, there are many different reasons that people have um, barriers to accessing driver's licenses. Um, as we got started with this campaign back in 2019, we wanted to make sure that we were able to help support others um, across the state of Georgia who had difficulties in accessing driver's licenses. Um, as of 2008, the state of Georgia had started to bar individuals without legal status from obtaining a driver's license. So as 
we have known very intimately with the work that we do, we do, this largely impacts undocumented immigrant communities, many of which come from the communities that we serve um, day in and day out. Um, but also Georgia has stringent requirements for individuals that want to change their gender marker on their driver's licenses. So this bars many transgender individuals from having accurate state issued identification. Um, in addition, uh, we have uh, very stringent requirements for what documentation we can use when you're applying for a driver's license, making it so that some people who um, either were formerly incarcerated or people that are survivors of domestic violence may not be able to access this documentation because of the types of documentation that they may have lost over the course of their experiences. So we know that um, the barriers to accessing driver's licenses show up in ma many different ways for our communities. The, the overall impact is that without a driver's license, it impacts so many aspects of our lives. And um, we recognize that having access to a, driver, a driver's license is one of the most basic things that our community should be able to access, especially without um, reliable public transport options here in the state of Georgia. Next slide, please. So going into a little bit more detail about who is actually impacted, um, I'll talk a little bit about the undocumented immigrant community here in Georgia. So um, according to the Migration Policy Institute, there are currently 322,000 undocumented immigrants ages 16 and up in the state of Georgia. Um, these individuals, as you know, are banned from accessing driver's licenses and cannot freely travel from place to place without fear of being pulled over and deported. This risk is even greater in counties with the 287G immigration enforcement agreements with ICE, um, possibly leading to family separation or prolonged detention. For those of you that don't know, 287G is a program whereby law enforcement officers cooperate with ICE and comply with requests to detain undocumented immigrants. Currently in Georgia, the Department of Corrections and five counties, including Floyd, where I live, um, Hall, Oconee, Polk, and Whitfield are, have opted into the 287G program. Um, according to the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute, Hall and Whitfield counties have high numbers of undocumented immigrants, so a lack of access to driver's licenses puts these individuals at an extreme risk of detention and or deportation if they are pulled over and found without a driver's license. Additionally, prior to 2021, Gwinnett and Cobb counties also had 287G agreements that were dissolved due to the advocacy of many organizations and community members, as well as changes in county leadership that resulted from the 2020 elections. However, we do know that undocumented individuals in these counties, Gwinnett and Cobb, are still being impacted by not having driver's licenses. Finally, um, the Mi Migration Policy Institute also shows that um, of the undocumented individuals that we have in Georgia, 67% of them are currently employed. Since these individuals cannot independently travel to work without fear, many of them have to rely on family members to drive them, um, as we heard from Alma's story earlier. Um, if they do not have people in their lives who can reliably drive them to work, they have to risk being able to drive from place to place and therefore risk deportation just to get to their workplace and be able to support their livelihoods and their families. Um, I'll pass it now to Annie from my team to, to continue talking about how um, lack, of lack of access to driver's licenses impacts other members of our communities. Annie? Thank you, Aisha. Sorry. Thank you, Aisha. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about other communities that a lack of driver's licenses impacts. So according to the Williams Institute, over 55,000 individuals ages 13 and up in Georgia identify as transgender. The state currently requires individuals to jump through onerous requirements, such as the submission of a physician's letter or a court order showing proof of gender affirming surgery in order to change their gender marker on their ID or driver's license. This process is not easy or accessible for everyone, leaving many trans individuals in Georgia without a state issued ID that accurately reflects their gender. Additionally, especially with the passage of SB 140 during this year's legislative session, which bars trans youth from receiving gender affirming health care, it is even more difficult now for members of the transgender community to meet the state's requirements to get a driver's license that reflects their identities accurately. This bill has also already been signed into law by Governor Kemp. 
Many transgender individuals could also face barriers to voting because they do not have a state issued ID that accurately reflects their name and gender, especially with Georgia being one of eight states with the strictest voter ID laws in the country. Next slide, please. Additionally, according to the Prison Pol Policy Initiative, over 17,000 individuals are released from prison each year in Georgia. Driver's licenses or state IDs are essential for securing employment, housing, and reliable transportation for individuals re-entering society. However, the state's requirements for obtaining a driver's license are not expansive enough to ensure every formerly incarcerated person is able to obtain the tools necessary to live their lives unrestricted. Currently, Georgia law does not allow for the use of prison or parole discharge papers as identification documents to obtain a driver's license. Without this, many returning citizens who may not be able to acquire required forms of identification may be unable to access many of the tools needed to live their lives. Next slide, please. 37.4% of women and 30.4% of men experience intimate partner violence or other forms of abuse or stalking in the state of Georgia. When leaving these situations, many survivors are forced to leave their belongings behind, often leaving them without identifying documents needed to restart their lives safely. Without documents like birth certificates or passports, survivors of domestic abuse often struggle to find secure and safe housing. Access to a driver's license could allow these individuals to access essential resources such as safe housing. However, as mentioned earlier, the state's list of accepted identifying documents is not very expansive. Next slide, please. So who will benefit from freedom to drive legislation? The Georgia Budget Policy Institute estimates that if undocumented immigrants are permitted to obtain driver's license, almost 165,000 undocumented Georgians would apply for one in the first three years alone. This would mean 165,000 individuals would be able to go freely from place to place, whether that be work, school, to visit family or friends, or anywhere else, without fear of immediate detention and or deportation if they are pulled over without a license. The state will also receive an almost $17 million increase in revenue from vehicle purchases, vehicle registration, vehicle titles, standard license plate fees, and motor, motor fuel taxes in the first year, three years of implementation alone. Freedom to drive legislation will additionally make it so that transgender individuals will be able to acquire state-issued identification without jumping through numerous obstacles, such as having to prove they have had gender-affirming surgery. Having an accurate state-issued identification card will also make things like voting an easier process. Finally, freedom to drive legislation will expand the list of identifying documents, of eligible identifying documents to receive a driver's license, making it so that returning citizens can use prison or parole discharge papers as identification documents and survivors of domestic violence can obtain driver's licenses to more easily secure safe housing. Freedom to drive legislation is essential to ensuring that people from marginalized communities are able to live their lives freely and access the resources they need to thrive. And with that, I'll pass it back to Jennifer and Tom and the Advancing Justice team. Thanks, Annie. Um, so over the years, we've collected uh, stories from impacted individuals, um, many have expressed anxiety and fear over going to the store and groceries. Um, others forego important appointments because they just simply can't get a ride. It, it hinders people's ability to find jobs um, or keep them and or just going to the doctor. Um, and it puts an extra strain on friends and family members who take the time out of their own schedules um, to drive in places. And one person even talked about moving to Georgia from New York City and how much harder, harder it is um, to get around in Georgia without a car. So this issue impacts um, individuals, but it also impacts families and entire communities. And um, it started with SB 488, enacted in 2008, uh, which mandated proof of lawful presence in order for, for individuals to obtain um, temporary licenses or verification cards. It effectively prohibits um, undocumented immigrants from obtaining driver's licenses by limiting allowable documentation for um, sufficient proof of identification and residency. In the same year, SB 350 was enacted, which subjects people to fines and fees, jail time, and makes it a felony to get caught, to be caught driving without a license in the state of Georgia. Um, and upon the fourth infraction in the five-year period, 
someone could receive um, a felony conviction. Um, and as part of the Immigration and Nationality Act, the 287G programs that Aisha had mentioned um, creates a formal agreement between ICE and, and um, local police departments that would allow police to enforce federal immigration laws. Um, this subjects undocumented immigrants to the threat of deportation for, for simple traffic violations in, in some counties. And uh, in 2021, the Freedom Drive Act was introduced, uh, HB 833, um, that would expand acceptable forms of identification and proof of state residency that also addresses issues faced by trans, formerly, trans persons, people formerly in prison, and domestic abuse survivors. Uh, most recently, HB 33 was introduced in the last legislative session that would have expanded access to undocumented immigrants. And what we would like to see in legislation is um, expand an expanded list of documentation, allowable, allowable documentation for identification and residency proof, um, making it more accessible for those with different types of documentation. Um, some examples of this identification would be uh, consular identification documents issued by a consular from the applicant's country of citizenship unexpired passports from, again, from the person's country of citizenship. Um, and residency documents could be utility bills, phone bills, uh, or tax filings with the Department of Revenue. In terms of appearance, um, we would want an ID card that is identical in appearance to a standard um, driver's license with the same physical orientation, horizontal orientation. Um, except for the distinction would be words that would say federal limits apply in the place of where the gold star would be on a real ID. And uh, with the red image of Georgia, um, instead, of, instead of a green a green one, an option for gender identity of male, female, or X um, per the applicant's request without a letter from a medical care provider. And uh, we would like the legislation to also include data protection that prohibits routine information sharing with ICE. Any information released would require a federal court order. Um, some states that had not included language for data protection have experienced um, instances where their information was shared with ICE. Other states have um, addressed this through separate bills. Um, and language that prohibits discrimination at any time, um, possible instances of investigation, arrest, detention would be prohibited um, for anyone having um, one of these um, driver's licenses. And anyone who is referred, um, excuse me, refused an ID to make a written request for a hearing, um, which would be granted within 30 days of the talk of the department receiving the request. And uh, we would like the ID to be valid for eight years and eligible for renewal and establish, the bill would establish a reasonable application and renewal fees. Um, and lastly, we would like for a fiscal note from the governor's office of planning and budget that would determine the cost and revenue for the bill. And now I'd like to introduce um, Mr. Trent Leon Learman, the Maryland Organizing Director at CASA Maryland, where he led a winning driver's license campaign. Campaign, Trent, welcome. Uh, th thanks, Tom. Um, so I'll just go through a very brief history. Um, I came to CASA in 2011, and actually at that time, um, we had lost driver's licenses. So um, I think, you know, Tom, you brought up how, you know, you have to have not like not for federal purposes on the driver's license. And so, you know, basically because of the Patriot Act in 2001, everything tightened around immigration. And then they said, you know, that all IDs have to be um, verified, all, all even like all government issued IDs. So in Maryland, we had actually had 
um, driver's licenses for people regardless of immigration status until um, I think it was 2007 when that was taken away. And then um, because of that like new law, the Patriot Act, and then we had to fight to get that back when we were able to eventually win in 2013 and 2014. Mm -hmm. And like just as Michelle was mentioning about Alma, that was like the huge catalyst, right? We were seeing um, a lot of deportations happening. And the only reason being like literally dozens of community members were being turned like turned over to ICE. Um, the pipeline was such that like the police would arrest someone for driving without a license. And then the detention center where they would only be for like 24 hours or 48 hours uh, for that crime of driving without a license would then turn them over to ICE. And then, you know, obviously it was a very minor offense, but ICE, ICE didn't care. Like once they, like ICE is enforcing the civil law of immigration violations, right? So, but they didn't care at that time, um, the, the criminal, how main, minor it was. And so, you know, we found ourselves at CASA, like, going around to different police departments, like, you know, basically organizing and pushing back to say, look, stop arresting people for driving without a license, just give them a fine, right? Because that was the police had the ability to do either or. And of course, like, you know, before passing legislation, um, that which is much more effective and stronger in keeping the police accountable to that, um, we had, we were pushing back very hard, just like, you know, town halls and like, you know, showing up for informational meetings with them. So what I'll say is like, you know, the driver's license campaign in Maryland really engaged a lot of partners too, because uh, obviously without uh, a, a driver's license, the truth is we obviously had so many CASA members that were just driving out of necessity. And so more drivers without um, without insurance on the roads. Um, so basically, you know, we engaged the insurance companies to support this campaign. We engaged, um, you know, employers in the healthcare system, as you were mentioning, right? Because people couldn't go to their doctor's appointments um, or in emergency situations. So enjoy in engaging healthcare systems, school systems, um, even like the motor, the the motor vehicle agency, though in Maryland, it couldn't be out front, right? And because it obviously is not a non-political agency, behind the scenes, they were saying to the elected officials, yes, this is the right thing. We need to get people um, licenses there, you know, for the safety of everybody. Um, and as obviously what they were saying as well uh, was that this was income for them as Annie pointed out, you know, for that agency, $17 million in Georgia was bringing just similar numbers in Maryland too. Um, but, you know, and Aisha pointed out too, like in Georgia, the Department of Corrections is a part of the 287G program. So even if police, you know, aren't enforcing immigra immigration laws throughout many counties in Georgia, if someone is driving without a license and they get arrested, all of a sudden they could, I mean, I'm sure many are ending up with ICE as they were in Maryland years ago. So just like um, it really forming a big coalition um, to push this. And obviously we had a lot of members speaking out about this, you know, about um, obviously the moving stories about, you know, not getting to a healthcare appointment, you know, not being able to keep, pick up a kid, like a child from school, Th those really moved the elected officials, but so did like, this all of these other groups. And I even will say we were even able to find a couple sympathetic um, police departments that even did support and like said, you know, why are they wasting their time on this when people who pass the driver's test should be able to drive themselves, right? So I um, the only other points that I'll just share is that um, a couple of things to look out for is, you know, in the interim, one thing to do is is passing legislation that makes driving without a license non-criminal so that it's only a fine. Obviously, that will prevent a lot of um, unnecessary ICE detentions. And the other thing, as Tom mentioned, was in Maryland, you know, and this is by no, no means a reason to not pass this legislation. Absolutely, this legislation is essential 
so many people get turned over to ICE for driving without a license. We did in Maryland see that um, once we did pass this law that ICE was accessing the, the database um, to get people's um, addresses for immigration purposes. So we advocated and it took us many years, but we were able to make sure that ICE could no longer do that without a warrant, just like all other federal agencies. But as Tom lifted up, if you can get that in the legislation, um, important. If you can't get it in the leg legislation, still pass the legislation. It's a way better situation than how it is now. Um, but obviously it's a, it's a flag to look for. And I think, um, I'm happy to answer any other questions, but it's really, this is like, you know, and I guess the only other thing I can mention um, is that in Virginia, they passed driver permission cards, um, which is, you know, like very close to what driver's licenses are. Even as Tom mentioned in Maryland, um, they have to say on the, they say not for federal use, right? On the cards, because people aren't, are often getting these cards without social security numbers. So in Virginia, the permission cards are slightly different, but um, but it's still way better, way, way better than, than not having any licenses or driver permissions. So any, I'm happy to answer any questions or um, if not, I can leave it there for now. And I really appreciate you all for like being here and fighting this fight. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna pause here and see if anyone has any questions for any of our speakers. Please feel free to use the Q&A function or the chat if you have any questions for any of our speakers. And also if any of our speakers have questions for each other, I'd encourage you to also ask questions of each other. We have some time, so. Um, if no one has a question right now, I'll I'll kick us off. I'll start with one. Um, Trent, I'm curious if there were, um, out of your whole experience advocating for driver's licenses in Maryland, what was sort of the most important lesson learned out of um, out of that experience that led to the victory? Yeah. So you know. I think that when we were in this campaign for driver's licenses, there was a lot of fear that elected officials had around complying with the federal, like the federal legislation. And so I think like having uh, experts, even like, as I was mentioning, all of these different coalition ex partners and experts um, that could share about how, you know, the compliance is correct and it's, it's actually a better um, to, than not having anything. So even having um, like people from the Georgia Maryland Vehicle Association, or uh, you know, even someone from the federal government to share about you know how they do it with other states uh, could be um, getting rid of those fears of elected officials. Obviously, like it is absolutely necessary to have directly impacted people sharing their stories about um, you know driving without a license and the necessity that they've had to do that. That's essential to push those community members through their fears about sharing those stories um, because that you know you have to show that you know people are doing it already, right? Like it's people have to do it. Thank you. If anyone has any other questions. Tom, I actually have a question for you. Um, you uh, Trent mentioned sort of the decriminalization of drivers of driving without a license here in Georgia. Um, and you talked a little bit about this. I was wondering if you could speak to sort of what um, Outside, and we've talked a lot about sort of the the pipeline to to detention or deportation. But what happens before that? Like, 
um, what are sort of the fines and fees and jail time that people are risking? Um, yeah, I can. Um, they uh, for for first time offenses, um, it could be a jail time of two days to twelve months, um, and the, that fine could be from five hundred to a thousand dollars. Um, license suspended for six months. Um, second offense would be ten days to twelve months, a um, thousand dollars to to um, two thousand five hundred six months, and it, it goes up to the fourth offense where it's one to five years in prison, twenty five hundred to five thousand in fines, and six months to life. So these are these are steep penalties um, for simply not having a license, but also not being able to, to get a license if they wanted one. Yeah. And it's so, um, you know, even, even with, it's such a disruption, you know, I think when you think about our lives, obviously dealing with jail time, but even with fines, you know, when we're thinking of, you know, obviously a fine is the least bad of those options, but fines can really be a burden, you know, on, individuals. And there's been a lot of work I know in Georgia on like reducing fines and fees and reliance on fines and fees in the state of Georgia as well. Uh, Trent, we actually have another question for you. Um, and the question is, if you faced any push, any type of pushback when advocating for the driver's license legislation and how you addressed the pushback? Yeah, so, you know, the major pushback was from anti-immigrant legislators and allies of theirs. And so I think, you know, obviously there's a lot of um, xenophobia and racism that we had to confront. And we did, right? We obviously said like, you know, this, is not, this has nothing to do with immigration. This is only about safety on the roads. So I think keeping it to that um, is important um, to share to lift up those stories about like, you know, getting to a doctor's appointments. We also lifted up obviously about how there was, there was actually people who were in the United States legally who couldn't get driver's licenses. Um, for example, like asylum seekers, right? Like there's a lot, there's a, a gray area where they haven't yet received their documentation, social security number, but they um, were here and they needed to be able to get to work and everything. So there's, um, that was another way we pushed back with saying like, you know, this is affecting a lot of others, not just people without status. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, Aisha and Annie also lifted up some other individuals who might have trouble um, just meeting the requirements, documentation requirements to get a license for various reasons. Um, and I think it's important to understand too that when you think about a driver's license, getting a driver's license, there is, like you said, like passing a driver's test. But uh, by and large, the things that you need to prove are really just you are who you are, your identity, and that you live in the state of Georgia, your residency, and that there are um, a lot of different ways that that uh, you should be able to establish those things that don't, again, have to do with your immigration status. So yeah. Uh, another question, and I think this is, uh, I don't know if this is for everyone uh, or if this is for Trent also, but um, actually it might be for you, Trent, <laughs> is how much legislator education was needed around this issue? Yeah, look, you guys have a really hard fight on your hands in Georgia. Um, you know, I can say actually like Casa Georgia, like whatever we can do to support on this issue too, like, please, I think you guys know Lucho, my colleague. So uh, we want to definitely be a part of this campaign. But I mean, it's right. It's it's a multi-year fight and it's requires a lot of legislator um, education. I think if I can say in Virginia, when they passed the driver's uh, permission cards, they were able to get like one person who was Republican to support it. And I think that was what that that was the only thing they needed. Um, 
yeah because yeah unfortunately like too often this turns into a um a debate around immigration so like the more i mean you like that you can not get pigeonholed into that fight um that you know i think it's it's better um but it's it's definitely a hard landscape you guys are in in maryland we're in a, we obviously we're in a much better landscape than you all were in terms of the political dynamics of our state but nonetheless it still took us in maryland it took us two years um at maybe actually i'd say actually three years to get to get it by to 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 really really engage um win this fight um but i would you know i think um as i said like as a as a coalition as a movement you guys should really potentially weigh if there's like um intermediate steps that could be useful towards getting you to there um like decriminalization or driver permission cards i mean obviously you guys are the ones that decide how much you're willing to com compromise and um and a lot of legislator education so the more that the legislators are hearing from just you know multiple different groups that aren't necessarily aligned but are in a coalition like then it will be more effective in convincing them thank you and our last question is how can we get involved i think that's a perfect segue actually um so if we can just go to the next slide and i'll talk i'll close by just talking a little bit about the existing Freedom to Drive Coalition, and then also how you can get involved um, and how you can advocate for this, this issue and just learn more. So um, like I said, the, the groups, uh, we have a few groups here represented, but there is a larger group of organizations um, involved in the Freedom to Drive Coalition. And we engage in a number of different strategies. And there are a lot of different ways that you can plug in, you yourself as an individual or as part of an organization. Um, I'll lift up some of our main strategies here so you can think about uh, where you might best plug in. Um, it's needed community engagement, talking to community members about the issue, um, identifying it as an issue for them if they have not heard of it as an issue, or if it is something that they've experienced, experienced getting them involved in the campaign. Organizational outreach, always, like Trent mentioned, looking for those different partners who are coming at the issue and want to solve the problem, maybe from different angles, but with the same ultimate solution. Um, legislative advocacy, the legislator education, as mentioned, is very important and really takes a, a large group of, of people. And you yourself as an, individual, indi as an individual can always reach out to your representative as an to mention driver's licenses as an issue that you care about, but also speaking to other legislators as well. The research is also an area of need for those of you who are researchers or data analysts and can really um, create that evidence base and arguments for why driver's licenses for all is a benefit to everyone in the state of Georgia. And then communication is always a need of how can we um, uplift that narrative about why driver's licenses for all is, is what is needed in Georgia and disrupt those negative narratives, um, again, about the connection to immigration or anything like that. Um, so there are a number of different ways that you can get involved. We'll pop in the chat a uh, Google form here if you are interested in joining the coalition, um, learning more, and just plugging into this campaign as we continue to grow support in the state of Georgia uh, for driver's licenses legislation. Um, we have the chat. Yeah. Oh, it's in the chat now, the form. And so if we can just go to the last slide, please. Um, yeah, so we just are like final ask for you today again is to please fill out the form um, so that we can get your contact information uh, if you want to learn more and join our campaign. And um, if you are a lawmaker <laughs> who is on this call, we would love to um, for you to be able to talk to your colleagues about this issue. And we're happy to help you connect you with community members um, or with other advocates who can help with those conversations um, and for individuals also to reach out to their lawmakers. We always, and develop those relationships, we always encourage that as well. So if there are no other questions, um, I will just close a big thank you to all of our panelists, 
on the call today and for everyone who took time out of their day to learn about this issue. Um, we really hope that you will join us in this campaign. Um, we look to states like Maryland and to Virginia and to Utah and places all across the country um, really to give us hope to see that we can do this here in Georgia. So we hope that Georgia will soon be the next state that will be able to expand um, access to driver's licenses um, to everyone in the state. Thank you.